Take two. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> this is the Pangburn Q&A. Today's guest is Brian Keating. We're just waiting in the room for Brian. Uh, if you haven't checked out the podcast between Brian Keating and myself, please go check that out. It's on this channel as well. Uh, physicist Brian Keating is also a uh, God-believing Jew. Um, and uh, he has authored... He, what's that? <laughs> I think he said he converted to Catholicism. I No, I think it's the other way around. Okay. I, I could be wrong. Maybe we should ask him that clarifying question. Yeah, that'll be the first question, I guess. <laughs> Are you a Jew? First question for when he comes into the room. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> that question has some historical context. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, uh, he doesn't seem to be convinced that there was a big bang that gave rise to our cosmos. Which is interesting. It is interesting. And yeah, it depends on what he means. Like, <laughs> there was obviously something that happened that could be characterized as a Big Bang, but right. it could have been that the entire universe was way hotter than it was, and it's cooled down or something. So I could see him wiggling out of it. Mm -hmm. But how's it going, Brian? Hey, can you see me? I uh, can't see you yet, but if you hover over the uh, window, it'll give you the option to turn on your camera. Now, uh, hover over it. Now, if your camera um, is camera through a... Oh, yeah, there Oh, there is. we go. Nice. Right on. Yeah. Okay, welcome, <clears throat> welcome uh, Dr. Brian Keating. We, we do not have a ton of time today, so we want to get to the questions as soon as uh, possible here. Uh, okay, yep. that's who's back. Um, oh, first question's mine. Uh, so, um, there are some people that would call Prager you a propaganda machine. What do you think about that claim? Um, well, I mean, that's obviously kind of ridiculous and on its face to call it just off its face a machine. Right. So it's, it's certainly right wing. It certainly leans conservative, but, um, you know, my, my feeling is that discrimination on viewpoint basis of viewpoint is uh, antithetical to the academic process. That's why I host people with whom I disagree all the time on my yeah. channel. I've had Noam Chomsky, whose views are odious to me on some of his categorization, characterization of America, of um, other human beings, of Israel, <clears throat> and so forth. So um, I think it's important to dialogue with both sides. If I give you an opportunity to speak to 3.9 million people have seen my various videos uh, and have a message that I think is positive and that will educate their listeners, including make me making statements to the effect that I support and believe in, as does Prager University and in, um, in human induced climate change. I think that was a first ever. And I think I should get respect for that, um, for, for, for causing them to take a stand in concert with the scientific community. So why would I not want to do that? Right. So, so yeah, it, I mean, whenever, you know, it's, it's the reason why I ask this question, because sometimes I'll see a quote that I think is interesting from like a PragerU uh, uh, video or document or meme or whatever, and I'll post it to mm -hmm. the Penguin Network. And it's a, it's a great litmus test for me, a uh, great uh, test of one skepticism to see who can refrain from attacking the... Yes the brand and dealing with the claim uh, that is being, or as opposed to dealing with the claim that's being made. Uh, yes. so I see that a lot with PragerU and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring that up. Cause I think, you know, sometimes some things will be said uh, and it'll have PragerU's label on it and people will just be like, Oh fuck PragerU. I'm not going to talk to pra PragerU. I'm Look, I've got 5,000 subscribers on my mailing list. I hope yeah. all you guys will subscribe RyanKeating.com. And uh, I get, you know, every time I send out an, a message, you know, I have a new Prager U thing out. I get a bunch of, how would you have on a, a neo Nazi and a right wing fascist? Right. And when I do, and I say, well, it's pretty interesting because he's, you know, he's written 
the most popular book about anti-Semitism, about anti-Nazism, right. and he's had on prominent people on all different sides of the political aisle. Um, so, you know, again, uh, I think we, as Marie Curie should uh, said, we should be more curious about ideas than the people who come up with them. I couldn't agree more. Uh, let's go to um, Dal Tzu. Dal Tzu was actually the the original person who sent you a message, Dallas Brown. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, yeah, Dal. Uh, to, to bring him on. Hey. Dal, go ahead. You're, uh, you're up. Um, well, I, I initially wanted to ask the question, uh, uh, really about the nature of these theories of everything that we get. It seems like, uh, a lot of them deal with like this ability to essentially predict infinite variations on the universe. So like string theory and, and Hilbert's mm -hmm. and, and, uh, Rulial space if we're doing Wolfram physics. So I was wondering, do, what do you think of the efficacy of building uh, theories of everything that can literally just encapsulate any possibility? Yeah, it's interesting that theories of everything don't necessarily have to comment on, you know, or a universal structure, universal genesis, origin structure. Some do. Um, and in that sense, they could be more properly considered theories of everything. Again, theory of everything doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to predict that Travis is looking to his right now versus his left. It means that you're subsuming the laws of fundamental physical forces under one rubric, under one overarching law, the same way we unified electricity and magnetism under one law. So my, um, my feeling is that to require that they reproduce, you know, kind of um, to require a theory of quantum gravity to predict not only the evolution of all the other forces, uh, but also to predict the origin of the universe, that could be um, that could be a, a little bit of over over scoping it. Uh, however, you know, in other words, I would settle for a grand unified theory. I would take a theory of everything, meaning quantum gravity, in addition to unifying strong, weak, and nuclear forces and with electromagnetism. Um, but to call it a theory of everything and say that it also has to establish the initial conditions of the universe, that's more in the context of cosmology. And there, you're right, there are dovetails with um, with quantum cosmology and the origin of the universe. Uh, and these are some of the wildest speculations, the origin of time, for example. So um, they may be related, they may not be related. Um, but, uh, but, but I think, you know, including both of them is, is maybe, as they say, overscoping, and you gotta maybe reduce the uh the, the claim scope of work i know uh you've had sabine hassenfelder on your podcast a few times and she very much seems against a lot of the more grandiose uh unified theory claims out there yeah sabina is a is a character she's a well-noted uh, curmudgeon i love talking to her i'm gonna have her back on soon and uh well you know, her main thing is that she's not going to look at a theory of everything if it's based on kind of the simplicity or this reduction of, of mm -hmm. complexity to make a, uh, a theory of everything that's beautiful, that's simple, that's symmetric. She, her viewpoint is that you are guided too much by looking for elegance and beauty. And, um, and that's actually destructive and leading to the lack of progress in physics uh, over the last 40 years, according to her and Lee Smolin. Uh, as well. So the question is, is beauty a good guide? And she and I debated this once, you know, that my, my feeling is beauty is a great, excellent, fantastic and essential guide to experimental physics. Whether it is or is not to theoretical physics is an open question. But to rule it out definitively, I think that's a mistake. It's kind of like saying, you know, like, you're wrong, let's debate. <laughs> uh, when she says, like, I'm not going to even look at Stephen Wolfram's theory, or Eric Weinstein's theory, uh, because it's just, you know, it's too complicated. I'm like, well, you can understand, you know, doubly special relativity and loop quantum gravity, but you can't understand geometric unity. Now, maybe she can't. Um, I can barely understand it, but she's much brighter than I am, and she's a theoretical physicist. So I feel like it's a little bit of, of uh, kind of talking about, um, you know, restricting the, the scope of the argument so she doesn't have to really delve too deeply into it, which I understand, you know, we only have so much time. And uh, she has certain priorities, but um, but yeah, I, I think it's interesting to to speculate on these things. I, I think a good follow up question to this, thanks, Dal, is: uh, Are there? Uh, do you see any issues with the current peer review process in the scientific community? 
Well, you know, peer review, uh, as Eric always points out, is only about as old as he is, you know, in its current form. In other words, it's not like thousands of years old. It's not hundreds of years. As I talked about you know, earlier, Galileo, he self-published everything. Every single thing was self-published, and there was no peer review. In fact, there was like anti-peer review after the fact, rather, where, you know, the Catholic Church had scientists that were, right. you know, examining and exhuming all what he was looking at. So, um, you know, in the context of peer review, I, I don't think it's a panacea. I think it's held up as almost with almost religious conviction. I can point to dozens of set of studies that were shown to be, you know, false, you know, either wrong, falsified, um, egregiously, unethically or unintentionally and not with malice. Um, you know, many of these things, including huge press conferences, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, you know, there'll never be a quote unquote scientific method. There is no like one scientific method. And it's kind of a, a tale that we tell each other. First of all, there's two different versions of the scientific method, right, Travis? There's inductive scientific method and uh, investigation, epistemology, and there's deductive scientific um, epistemology. So just right there, it's like having two theories of classical mechanics. There's no one theory, there's no right. And that's a byproduct of the fact scientific method emerges from scientists who themselves are human beings. And therefore, even though I don't believe social science is science, I believe there is a social science of scientists. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's it's incumbent upon us to not worship it too much, but also use it where it's valuable, um, but, but not expect that it's the sine qua non of accuracy and perfect uh, um, and, and perfect guarantee, guarantor of scientific accuracy. Mm. Okay, let's go to uh, uh, Symmetry. Uh, you're up. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I basically, w just kind of picking off of Dal, um, I was going to ask about, you know, quantum gravity and strings and uh, yeah, some supersymmetry, things like that. But uh, I love all of what you say. Uh, I agree with most all of it. It's very, not, very great. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, I think yeah. we can talk about those things. I'm absolutely happy to talk about. Absolutely, them. I don't have any super specific questions. That's my that's my fault. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess we can just talk about the importance of understanding quantum gravity. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of this unfinished goal, and you know, <clears throat> Travis and I have spoken to Michio Kaku, and and you'll just hear the same mm -hmm. lines. You kind of talk in your own book, right? Uh, Travis will he'll go off on the one inch long equation written in the language mm -hmm. of mathematics that is the language God talks, and will reveal the God equation connecting our universe via a mm -hmm. string umbilical cord to another. You know, so. There's all this hyperbole and so forth. Now, why is it um, why is it worth thinking about? Well, first yeah. of all, I think you know there uh, we live in a universe with with a known and limited integer number of forces, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, the universe is governed by by rational numbers and irrational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers play roles, mm -hmm. um, but the integers seem to be prominent in that we can we can see their effect via their um, the number of, 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 of families of quarks, the number of leptons, the number of mm -hmm. hadrons. Those are discrete numbers, and uh, those are integer numbers. And so uh, the question becomes, when you try to quantize something like gravity, going from a classical theory to a quantum theory, what is the mm -hmm. cost of the quantum uh, nature of it? So making it discrete and in integer-like, rather than rational and smooth and continuous, like a function in calculus. Um, mm -hmm. And so are our mathematics capable of describing something like this? And uh, is there, an, is there um, an emergent phenomenon that predates and preempts our, our discussion of quantum mechanics? In other words, we think about quantizing gravity, but what if it's space and you know, space time itself has to be thought of in a quantal quantized fashion? Yeah, That's exactly. the notion of loop, loop quantum gravity. So I have a video coming out about that in a couple of weeks where I go in and what is loop quantum gravity? What does it solve? What failings does it have when it fails to match observations? Um, but is it, is it, is it completely wrong? I don't believe any of these things are completely wrong guys. I think some mm -hmm. of them have actual legitimate uh, insights and we can learn a lot about the early universe and let a thousand flowers bloom. But what I get into trouble with is when the, uh, it sucks up all the oxygen. So I asked, yeah. I asked Michio, I said, Michio, um, you know, you're the director of the National Science Foundation. I gave you, just conferred this upon you. Um, now you get to uh, delineate all of our science, public policy and funding policy and priorities. How much money do you spend on string theory? How much do you spend on alternatives? And he was like, equal amounts for everybody. 
and that's a nice, you know, Travis will recognize that as, you know, kind of a appeal to, to, uh, to numerical bias, right? So this is a classic thing where you're just like, you're walking in the middle of the road. And as I've often said, you know, uh, there's a Russian proverb, he who walks in the middle of the road gets hit by both sides of the traffic. Mm. So from my perspective, it's great to, to be passionate and to take a viewpoint, but maybe we're missing, you know, something fundamental, which is, you know, I brought up in the video discussion with Travis earlier, you know, do we need, do we know that we need to have a quantum theory of, of gravity? In other words, if the only instantiations of a quantum gravity theory are in unobservable singularities hidden behind event horizons and black holes, or mm. if they're hidden, you know, cosmic censorship, um, naked singularities are forbidden uh, in, in primordial black holes, or if the universe's Big Bang singularity is obscured by uh, effectively a cosmic event horizon, uh, and that we don't believe we'll ever be able to get to exactly time equals zero. So the old question of, you know, who ordered that, of is it or rabbi, you know, who ordered that we have to have a theory of quantum gravity? Is it not just mm. an extension of kind of our, our hubris as successful as we are as, as scientists to quantize the world? And, but maybe, maybe it ends. Maybe there is no quantum theory of gravity. Mm -hmm. Mm. Interesting. Great. Thanks, Symmetry. Uh, I want to throw the mic over to uh, Keith. Keith, uh, do you have a question for Dr. Brian <laughs> Keating? Yeah, actually, one came up in my mind earlier when you started out. You were talking about uh, kind of creating curiosity and like giving children a telescope and just some profound experiences you had looking up at the sky. Um, I was wondering if if you have any thoughts or opinions on what Elon Musk is doing with his Starlink, and uh, you know, I guess he's come out with a new model that's apparently less reflective. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, apparently, when you when I've seen photos of it, I haven't seen it myself. But you can look up at the night sky and just see yeah. like these symmetrical lines of yeah. his satellites, and he. You know, he plans to launch however many hundreds of thousands or, or you know, tens of thousands more yeah. before he's done. I think the mm -hmm. concept of having internet everywhere I go is really cool. But do you feel like that's detracting a little bit from just the wonderment of the night sky? Um, it could. It, it could. On the other hand, the sky is vast. and um, And, yes, these satellites can be made less reflective. They're primarily troublesome, you know, at, uh, within an hour or two of sunset or sunrise, like the ISS will be, um, they move in low earth orbit. Um, they don't occupy many pixels. Uh, they're actually more harmful than what I do, which is uh, microwave millimeter wave astronomy, which you can think about as like radar. And, uh, because anything above absolute zero emits microwave radiation, black body form, um, these objects will be roughly at the temperature of the moon, you know, a couple hundred Kelvin. They'll be, you know, emitting like, uh, like little tiny planets or, or little tiny moons. And they are going to, they're impossible to, to cloak uh, via radar. That's why, you know, the stealth bomber, you could make it 100%, you know, radar absorbing, but that would make it 100% thermal emitting. And remember, mm -hmm. what I'm looking for is the afterglow of the Big Bang and its thermal signature in the millimeter wavelength regime, which is exactly where these satellites broadcast. A, uh, 5G is in the tens of gigahertz bandwidth, which is a primary cosmic microwave background regime band. And if you even if you shut them off, uh, they can't be blackened uh, microwave-wise because then they'll just emit even better as radiators, and we'll see these hot little streaks going through all of our data sets. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're much more of a problem for microwave astronomy um, than for optical astronomy, and they are a problem for optical astronomy. So it remains to be seen. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I first of all care about human beings. So one of the things I'm interested in doing is learning, like, what is he going to do with these? Uh, because there's China, right? And and he could he could be spreading, you know, actual internet, you know, radio free America from our, our uh, from from these from these satellites and he could make it completely free over China he could make it you know anyone with an, with a simple you know uh, cell phone could basically download it and uh, will he do that will he take that mantle you know on and I'd almost trade you know easily trade rather I would definitely trade you know the science that I'm doing uh, for a billion 300 million people having access to freedom and information 
I think I care about human flourishing. Travis and I spoke about that earlier. That preempts my even my scientific curiosity to want to understand the universe, because eventually we'll understand it. We could build a telescope on the moon. You won't have these satellites there. You can do it. We've had many satellites so far outside of Earth orbit. So, um, so I'm curious: Will he do something for human flourishing, or will he, or will he ignore that opportunity? And I, I tend to think of history as a guide. You know, he wants to sell Teslas in China. And he's going to keep doing it. So, that's a little sad, sad fact. But thanks for the question. Yeah, that's really interesting. Can I just add a little follow up? Yeah. Um, sure. <clears throat> so, I mean, obviously, you're really passionate about your work. So that's a pretty big statement to. You know, to put humanity before your work, and could you expand on that? I guess, in what way do you think uh, giving internet access to the world would be a net benefit for humanity? Well, they have internet access, but they're incredibly censored. Their lives are, you know, I have colleagues in China. I've I've mentored students that became professors in China, and I can't share the conversation I had with Travis today. Right. I cannot share that to them. Yeah. Uh, even even uh, even simple things cannot be shared with them. Uh, it, it, we can't even conceive of it, even though some say, like Eric Weinstein, and other you know, that we're heading down this path of of kind of you know total internet you know uh, obfuscation, control, even even suppression of thought and ideas pictured in 1984, um, et cetera. And you think about um, we can't conceive of it, even though we could see. Maybe some hints of, of PC and thought control and so forth. That's you know where you have compelled thought and forbidden speech. Uh, some of which you know you agree with. You don't want to have like people saying awful human racist things about people necessarily. But when you talk about the Chinese people and the North Koreans, don't forget. You know, all, think about all these countries that are that are so excluded from uh, from the from the from freedom of information. I mean, we have so mm -hmm. many so few freedoms, people. I mean, we have freedom of speech and it's under attack, uh, left yeah. and right. Um, like guard your freedom. Like I'm not a big gun nut, but like, I look, how many, how many freedoms do we have left? And, and I'm not, you know, again, I'm a political atheist. So yeah, I'll appear on NPR and I'll appear on uh, Prager university. I don't give a crap because I want the message of, of a hopeful vision of, as Travis said, human flourishing to progress and proceed so that we can achieve what is unique about us, what's unique about us is not our country, our flag, our baseball, our hockey team, rather. It's it's that we have this three-pound supercomputer on top of our heads and that we can mm -hmm. conceive of something that, I don't care if you're atheist or not, is divine, right? Even Travis would say, if we can conceive of a grand unified theory, that's something we know no bonobo can do. And so I want to I want to get, I want to live forever. I want to explore as much as I can. I want to do it in freedom. And guess what? Locking up 1.3 billion people that are some of the most brilliant human beings on earth. And I know, I know them. And I've, you know, I'm invited to speak yeah. there all the time. Um, we're locking away human flourishing. Here, we're here. locking up the, the yeah. ability for the brightest people along with us. And there's no better or worse human being on earth than, than me or than you or than Travis. So why wouldn't you want them to be free? Think of what we could do as a species with, with flourishing of freedom and this yeah. computer that we're all given at birth. I, I just, I get chills thinking about what he could do. And I think it's so much more important than going to Mars or, or anything. If he could just do that, because because that gets leverage. You get the unlocking of human flourishing. You get the unlock. You get a leverage of 7 billion to 1 or whatever. It's so much more. And we'll get to Mars. We'll get there. Don't worry. You know, we went from horse and buggy. You know, my grandmother saw the horse and buggy. And she saw people on the moon and people on TikTok. Okay, we're yeah. going to get there. Yeah. Don't worry about it. The progress is astounding. We'll get there, but if we won't, if we're uh, if we have if we allow other human beings to be treated like chattel and kept in intellectual prisons of the mind, controlled yes. by states, and I fear for I fear for for the planet and our lack of progress if that occurs in more and and in, in, uh, to more extent. Sorry, yes. that's my rant. My uh, rant about freedom. Thank you. Uh, I agree. That's great. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Nivik. Nivik, uh, what's your question for Brian? Yeah, um, I just wanted to more get the psychology of religion. As um, have you ever wondered? Because since it's the environment in why people are religious, in familiarity and relatability, and why certain people happen to be in the religion that they're based in, because mm. of their environment they're born in and that they're comfortable with it, psychologically and where they are in it, uh, partially because of them being a product of their environment 
by no choice. And if you should therefore take in more religions in different per- inter- interpretations and in deeper understanding of God and how to perceive religion in a deeper way of understanding in order to believe where you are in belief right. is therefore more rational by getting a deeper understanding to religion in order mm-hmm. to approach. Yeah. No, I get it. I get the question. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So I'll say this. Uh, is it um, how probable is it if you have a ball, if you have a bag and you have a thousand balls in there and you pull out a ball uh, that it's, you know, one of all these ping pong balls that are white, there's one that's red. So you pull it out, there's 0.1% chance you're going to get that one. So I'm Jewish. That's 0.1%, 0.2% of the world's population. Would I be Jewish if I wasn't born, you know, in America or like, uh, uh, of course, I mean, it's ludicrous. You know, if I'm born again in somewhere in China or somewhere in Saudi Arabia or Nairobi, Kenya, you know, uh, of course not. I, I'm not deluded into thinking, oh, well, I have this mission. I have this messianic complex. I was done for this reason. But by the same token, as Chris, as Chris Hitchens um, has said, and as Richard Dawkins has said, you know, basically, if you call yourself um, uh, Christian, like a baby, when they're born, they say, oh, we're welcoming into Jesus, you know, whatever, this Christian baby, he calls that child abuse. I mean, he actually says in one of his books, what Dawkins does, that, and now he's you know, provocative. I mean, we, we know him, uh, uh, <laughs> that he is, and, and, I, and I love his mind, and I love to talk to him. I'm trying to get him on my show. But the point is, um, you know, in his opinion, you, you should never tell someone that they're religious at birth. You should let them discover it. And I think that's that's so fallacious. Uh, just one example. I don't know a single person whose parents were like really, really devout, um, you know, atheist or devout religion. And in the sense that they switched, you know, completely bipolarly to the opposite. In other words, someone who grows up like Phil Zuckerman, you know, who who's this secular theorist at, at, uh, at the Claremont College is, you know, his kids, he's raising his kids secular. Of course, he's born Jewish, but whatever. We're not going to get into it that but he's raising them completely secularly they will never go to church they'll never go to temple they'll never go to anything mosque or anything but um but you know it's almost inconceivable that such a person would grow up to become like devout like i'm not saying like maybe they'll get married to somebody that will want them to be you know in some religions culturally but to be devout to be a priest to be a rabbi it's almost inconceivable um but if you don't like i think the natural state it's it's easier let's just be honest right travis it's easier to be an atheist quote i don't mean like intellectually i just like you don't have to do as much you don't have to do as much right I, you don't have to buy any special food right travis you don't have to keep your kitchen utensils separate like, i'm not even saying i'm not saying it as a criticism i'm just saying a fact well, atheists have my, fewer things they have to do yeah one thing about that is i would say my moral foundation does change that up for me like you know if i if i see a company out there that i think is working antithetically against the well-being of, of humanity then that will perhaps make me not sh- buy that product or go to that, right. that mm-hmm. business uh, if mm-hmm. it's something I can demonstrate uh, from from my my well-being metric. But yes. but yeah, as far as like uh, ritual uh, dogma tenets like that, uh, I don't really live by any that that stand in the way of my uh, of of what of let's say my pleasure drive as long as I'm. Uh, acting morally based on on you know my well-being metric so yeah so so in that sense like you would um now maybe your parents are religious i don't know about your upbringing necessarily but you know maybe they were and you became an atheist or maybe they're atheists too or maybe it doesn't even matter they just were agnostic or, or what have you but i know for sure just as dawkins says that it's like child abuse i would never say it's child abuse to raise your kid as an atheist even though i think you would potentially be um be uh, perhaps eliminating one of the uh, parameters of faith space that they could find their own personal uh, flourishment, development, satisfaction, rituals. If you tell them that God is a fairy tale, stupid idiots believe in it. It's all made up. It's all Bronze Age peasants. There's nothing good. And I'm not saying you're doing that, Travis. I would never say that. I'm just saying if you if you're the kid of Dawkins, how likely right. is it he you know is going to become a priest? Yeah. Zero. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> yeah. So not, to answer this not question, very, or, not, not very likely, unless you know you have this uh, rebellious uh, moment. Maybe they get into it for the wrong reasons, or whether there are good reasons or not, I don't know. But yeah, I think uh, I think where the the child abuse would come in would be, and I would and I would say this from an emotional psychological perspective would be okay. Say you you raise your kid in whatever whatever faith, and 
you know, they go to school and they learn about evolution by natural selection and then they come home and they want to share that and talk about it with the family. And, you know, in some emotionally abusive, psychologically abusive way, you tell that kid, uh, you better shut up about that because that is, that, yeah. that is blasphemy. And, and, you know, uh, Oh no, happens. I had that with one of my listeners that right. she, I'm not going to talk much about it, but she, she talked about a horrible experience she had with, with, with yeah. her rabbi growing up and, it's exactly the same. You could have it in both sense. So no, I don't believe religion yeah. is is a panacea. Or... And I agree with you. If, if you if if like my kids in the future come home and want to talk to me about this awesome idea about Jesus Jesus Christ and uh, and what Jesus did, and you know, and now my kids starting to think, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of a God and believing in a God. It makes me feel good. It's. Uh, I think it would be abusive for me to do some kind of psychological or emotional uh, training, or, or you know, I call it indoctrination. If you if you go mm. through an indoctrination process to endow exactly how you want your kid to be, exactly. I think that is uh, child abuse. Yeah, you, yeah. Your kids are yeah. not supposed to be clones of you, and the true essence of love, at least in the Hebrew language, you know, the connotation of love. Is a selfless, it's a sacrificial love, but it's not a, uh, it's not a coercive love. And I think so many parents on both sides. Look, I'm going to say it as a Jew, but I'm also going to say it as, um, uh, you know, as an as an agnostic, but also towards towards people of militant atheism, that that can be toxic towards just the, again flourishing again your relationship with your child, and um, and 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 that has to be sacrosanct. At least because I believe the most the most precious commodity there is, and I've debated this with um, with people on all different religions. I don't believe it's time. I don't believe it's money. I believe it's innocence, and I believe like preserving an innocent side of a child. I've never met someone who's like innocent, naive, and they are age like forty, and they they got married, but they don't know how to make a baby. Like no, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Like, but <laughs> but I have met people that they've seen pornography. And they've seen violent pornography or they've seen violence on TV, snuff film, and just awful things. You can see it on Twitter now, Travis. It's, it's mm. You can see James Altucher and I talked about this on one podcast. He's like, I can point you to like 15 like X-rated snuff films on Twitter. Like your kid can just pick up your phone and see people yeah. getting murdered well, they have a in problem. a psychosexual. Yeah, Twitter, yeah, Twitter even has a problem with like child pornography, uh, like stuff that, that sits on Twitter for hours. Be, be, yeah. Just because there's yeah. so much sharing of information that uh, t Twitter, when you have this platform, you try your best to develop bots and and things to catch these things. But then you're you're dealing against human minds, and and the right. and the, and the human mind is going to say, "Oh, okay, we now know that the bot was set up to to figure out this language, so mm -hmm. we're going to create another term so that people can find this." Uh, yeah. immoral material so it's a real it's a real problem trying to trying to you know somehow get ahead or or trick the mind of a you know i guess for maybe lack of a better term an evildoer uh yeah okay i want to can i, I ask one get, quick question yeah nivik we'll get back to you in a second i want to give amy an opportunity i know we don't have uh, uh brian for very long here amy do you have a question for brian hello Oh, we can't hear you, girl. Are you muted? I can see your video. Amy, no. Amy, no. That... Oh, there we go. We can hear you now. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I enjoyed the conversation. I think you're hilarious. Um, and I listened to most of it. And I guess this is, I don't even know if I want to waste the, the time mentioning it, but you were, co you were comparing and contrasting um, an agno ag agnostic with an atheist. And I kind of like was like looking into the definitions and trying to see where you were coming from with that, because I guess I never really had a name for what I call myself, but I kind of mm -hmm. realized, you know, I guess I am agnostic in a way. And mm -hmm. then so your perception that, that you have to be an, an active, I forgot, I wrote down what you had said, but you know, that, that got me thinking. And so the definition of, the, the Merriam-Webster definition of an agnostic does kind of align with your point that you were making that you may as well just be an atheist. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess my, my question to you would be, you know, I don't even, I, I don't say that, I wouldn't say that I align with that definition of an agnostic, meaning it's unknowable. But for me, it's just kind of like, I don't think it's 
as unknowable as just that I don't know. I mm. don't know what mm -hmm. that looks like. I do believe yeah. in, a, in like a higher power. So, so it's not that I think it's ultimately unknowable, but I personally don't know. And so yes. I think you, if right? I, if Is I, that yes. Yes. Yeah, if I okay. may say something just before Brian, I just wanted to say one thing that may help out is that belief deals with theism and athe atheism. That's, yes. That's the realm of belief, but but agnosticism and gnosticism deals with knowledge. So when you say I don't mm -hmm. know, you you can be a, a a an agnostic atheist which would mean you are, you currently don't believe in a god. Uh, but you don't know if there are gods or not. That's what an agnostic yes. atheist is. But go ahead, Brian. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just going to say that, um, you know, one of my recent catchphrases is that, uh, and I got this from the late, great Freeman Dyson. You know, he said, um, you know, why wouldn't you want to study God? God is a mystery. You know, even if it doesn't, God doesn't exist. He, it, she, whatever you want to call it, doesn't exist. Um it's a mystery and physicists love mysteries. And mm. I started to think for a second, what's the difference between a mystery and a puzzle? So in my office, I've got, you know, these, all these puzzles and brain teasers and so forth. A puzzle is something that I might not be able to do, but, but you could solve it like a crossword puzzle, a Rubik's cube, um, you know, these bar kind of toys with the chains and the links and stuff like some of those I can do some of those I, I can't those. do. Yeah, me too. Uh, but uh, but they're fun to do. And if you ever see a kid, once they solve a Rubik's cube, they want to do it again, or they solve some puzzle. Like they want to do it again. And like I've got this crossword app on my phone, and one of my kids, like he loves to solve it. And then like as soon as he's done, he just moves on to the next one. I'm like, hold on a second, like let's save for the moment. But I started thinking, a puzzle is by definition solvable. It was created by a mind, you know, not unlike ours, and so therefore it can be un. Uh, it could be unboxed and it can be deconstructed and solved in some way. I may not be able to do it, but somebody smarter than me can. However, a mystery may not be solvable. It may be incomprehensible to a mind. Um, and that could be a mystery of quantum gravity. It could be that yep. uh, there's a mystery of God's existence or, or whatever. But so my job in the limited number of years that I have is I want to make as many mysteries into puzzles as possible. That's my goal. Mm. And that's nice. kind of, you know, my, my hope. And so that's what I dedicate to. And that's why I was saying on the video with Travis earlier today, you know, my goal, even with what I do for my work, because people are like, oh, we should have separation of, you know, science and state or, you know, whatever. Like, you, you shouldn't let God get into it. But I'm like, what if you can, like, you can do both? Like, there's no law that says mm. I can't do both. I can't investigate with earnest sincerity yeah. the question of whether or not God exists. Being prepared to accept the negative answer that God does yeah. not exist as a scientist, I want to do that. And if I can do that as part of my job, well, I'm glad that I'm doing that. And and I didn't take the job I used to have of being a dishwasher in a fancy French restaurant. Nothing wrong mm. with it, but um, but it's like I get I get paid to under to try to comprehend. Now, most of my day is not looking up and contemplating the heavens, but when I get those rare moments and I can think about it, and also to communicate to you guys and the public. Well, what you guys pay and support via tax dollars for me to do? Well, not well, not Travis because he's a Canadian. But but anyway, <laughs> the rest of you normal people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so that, that was all I gotta beautiful, get back man. To yeah, my group, I have my group meeting coming yes, up, so I got yes. a couple. I'll take. Yeah. I'll do like a lightning round if there's a couple of really quick questions. Well, well, I was gonna, I was, I was gonna just let you go. I think, uh, I think. Um, don't, I just don't want you to be a stranger. We're here every night having uh, conversations. Yeah. If you ever feel like popping yeah. in, you'll you'll see our conversations happening. But yeah, I know. I, let's give you a bit of a break here. You've been going all morning, but thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. I, I hope to. Uh, I'll send you some more content when yeah. I have these God versus Science videos coming yeah. out. And uh, and, and then uh, yeah, someday it would be good to get you on maybe with uh, with. Um, with uh, some of the more religiously inclined people and, yeah. and even my friends like Peter Bogosian, who's written a lot yep. about, um, about skepticism and Michael Shermer, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, That'd be yeah. a lot of fun. Travis, I really enjoyed right. it. I followed you for a long time. Congratulations on all your success. And Thank you. you uh, thanks for getting me into discord. I, I have a discord server. I don't even know how to use it until now. So thanks yeah. to Dal also. All right. <laughs> thanks my friends. Thanks a lot, brother. Have a great Talk weekend brothers. Bye. Yep. Bye sister. Bye. Yep. Bye.